Today's presentation will be given by Yingyi Ma, Associate Professor of Sociology and a Senior Research Associate in the Center for Policy Research at Syracuse University. Professor Ma is also the Director of Asian, Asian American Studies at the University of Sy uh, at Syracuse, and she is a public intellectual fellow of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and her <coughs> research interests lie in education and migration. Today, she will be speaking on the ambitious and anxious Chinese undergraduates in the United States. Please join me in welcoming her. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for your um, kind introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. This is my first time to be at University of Michigan campus. Um, very, uh, some, some a personal note about myself. Um, I stepped my foot on the United States for the first time almost 20 years ago, also as a Chinese international student. But back then, um, just according to my life experiences, uh, very, very few Chinese um, international students came as undergrads. So I came as a graduate student, fully funded by Johns Hopkins University. Um, so beyond my wildest imagination, I could have um, uh, been funded by my family. Um, even if they're, they can afford doing that, uh, I could not really get a student visa. So that was then, 20 years ago. So um, this is an important personal note. And also, um, just natural for me to be very interested in this new wave of Chinese international students, largely self-funded by, um, by their families, and um, really representing a huge um, social transformation in China. So um, I want to um, introduce to you my forthcoming book. This is a book cover uh, released. Uh, it's going to be released by Columbia University Press uh, in about two months <coughs> or so, so you can pre-order it on Amazon. And some a little bit uh, sort of a marketing note. And um, so I, I, I want to start from this uh, um, media headlines. And Chinese students um, has been quite a um, popular topic covered by journalists in recent years. When I started this research actually seven years ago in 2012, um, Chinese students have not really yet made m this many headlines in the news. So this is a couple headlines I want to share with you as you can see that there is almost a theme that almost flowing out of the screen that is so much about uh, the new rich, the wealth, um, the luxury lifestyles. Um, and then after um, Trump administration um, came into power, uh, Chinese students, in addition to their wealth, um, they're um, portrayed um, even directly quoted by the politicians as spies and national th security threats. So um, this is really the motivation of the book. And I just want to um, sort of um, highlight it, the media headlines, because my research is trying to move beyond this unidimensional and um, I would argue dehumanizing experience um, or coverage in the media. And um, through research, I want to provide a more balanced and nuanced portrait of this new wave of Chinese students. Um, and I intend to examine a diverse set of Chinese students, um, not just their wealth, because I know that some of the students are not really coming from extremely wealthy families. Um, they have very different family backgrounds. And I also want to connect their um, educational backgrounds. Actually, they're traveling along very distinct educational trajectories coming to the United States. So this is uh, uh, the motivation of the book, also the purpose of the, bro the book. So sort of some of the uh, national statistics in terms of the enrollment. Um, as we all know that uh, we have witnessed a skyrocketing growth of Chinese international students at the undergraduate level. Um, Chinese in international students like me, uh, we're not newcomers to the, to the American higher education. But undergraduate students are relatively new. As you can see, um, the solid line is um, represented by the growth of, um, un uh, of undergraduate students. And I'll see whether this works. So this, it marks um, around 2004, it really marks the turning point that the enrollment of undergraduate students really surpassed uh, the enrollment of graduate students. Now has become the majority of Chinese um, international student population. So this um, graph really shows 
the, um, the decade data from 2005 to 2015. So what happened um, in the recent years, especially during after Trump came into power? Um, after Trump came into power, there is a, a obviously a chilling effect on international students overall. And starting from uh, 2017, we have, um, for the first time ever, a decline of international student population overall. But Chinese international students are still growing. So um, for example, in 2016 to 17, uh, they grow by 6.8%. Uh, from 2017 to 18, undergraduate enrollment still grew by Four percent. Um, so right now, the most recent statistics shows that there are close to 150,000 undergraduate students from China currently enrolling in American higher education. So um, a different approach to look at the enrollment statistics is to look at the growth rates. So a lot of people, um, journalists, um, higher education administrators, uh, understand the growth. From um, oftentimes they argue that um, cash-strapped universities need money from China, need tuition dollars, and that's um, definitely true because financial crisis definitely escalate the growth rate of um, the international students from China. But this picture, this uh, growth rate, actually shows that the turning point, the highest um, growth rate, actually occurred before the financial crisis. It is during the year of two. 2006 to 2007, the growth rate really reached the peak. Um, and then, you know, over the past um, 10 years or so, the growth rates are actually already declining on a steady basis. Um, so I'm not really saying that financial crisis is not uh, the important factor. It is actually a very important factor bringing about a lot of uh, Chinese in international students. But we also need to pay attention to the other factors. Um, and I would want to um, mention that there are two important factors. One is the relaxing student visa policies during the later term of the George Bush administration. And this is something that is pretty counterintuitive to public awareness, because we all know that um, during the term of George W. Bush administration, we have 9-1-1 and 9-11. Um, I actually arrived before 9-11, and I have my personal friends and colleagues uh, whose visa were uh, denied or just rejected because of this um, very uh, tightening of student visa policies. But around 2003 or 2004, um, higher education and corporate America have made a, a very, very convincing plea to the Congress and has uh, successfully reversed the, st the student visa policy. So around 2005 or 6, back then the, uh, the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice has made uh, the visa policy has uh, be been their pr one of their priorities. So e effectively make it possible for um, self-funded or even um, half-funded, so with the partial funding from the United States, um, the, those students able to arrive um, in the United States um, higher education with the student visa. And the other factor we need to be aware is, we all know that this has uh, a lot to do with the rising middle class population in China. Um, they're able to afford this very expensive American higher education. But we also need to look at this uh, important um, uh, currency appreciation. So from 1998 to 2005, uh, the US dollar and RMB ratio has stayed pretty much stagnant at 8.3. Um, so that was the time when I arrived. So one dollar is, um, is eight yuan at the time. And from 2005 to 2014, so um, the yuan start to appreciate in the year of 2005 and uh, from the during the nine year period the RMB appreciated by 36 percent so not only because of the changing social structure in China the, the burgeoning middle class population but also because you know their money just worth more okay <coughs> so um, and this has a lot to do with the framing of my book um, I argue that we need to look at Chinese international students' population, this new wave of international students at undergraduate level, um, from the perspective of 
um, this new China. So they embody the new China undergoing the rapid um, economic growth and a huge change of the social structure. According to um, a sociologist, a Chinese sociologist uh, Lu Xueyi published a book on uh, social stratification in China. The new strata has come uh, into being in China, which is the rise of white collar occupations. Um, so those occupations um, are the the are the ma the majority of the burgeoning middle class population in China. So according to there are different definitions of middle class population um, in China, but according to um, um, Barbons, who is a um, sociologist at University of Sydney, published an article in 2018. Um, his calculation um, amounts to middle class population is over four um, four. 400 million population. So it's actually larger than the overall population in the United States. So there is a huge increase of middle class population in China. And those increase happening during the, this very short amount of time. And that really give rise to um, a very complicated and complex sentiment, I would argue, uh, to be the duality of ambition and anxiety. Um, so here I quote a book. Um, written by Evan Osnos. I believe that China scholars are pretty much aware of this book, uh, written in 2014. The book is called The Age of Ambition, has won the National Book Award. And e Evan is a journalist uh, written for, uh, writing for The New Yorker. And um, so in that book, um, he has rightfully captured the new China um, using this word ambition to characterize Chinese society. Um, I think that's a very, very uh, right approach. I would argue that um, there is actually an integral part of ambition that um, Evan has not um, focused on that I want to focus on in my book, that is anxiety. And uh, no part of life in Chinese society uh, other than education arena is best represented by this duality of ambition and anxiety. Um, so it is best um, actually manifested in this rising middle class parents, um, their desire to preserve um, the, their social economic status, if not really uplift uplift their children through education. So, um, so we can only understand their experiences, this new wave of undergraduate students from China, um, by connecting with their cultural, educational, and social backgrounds in China. So I think that is uh, the approach I take in this book. Um, much of the literature studying international students' population overall in the education literature is really trying to focus on, I would argue, in this um, in this, uh, um, in this paradigm of adjustment and assimilation. How do they adjust to American society? How do they adapt to American society? So there is this neglect of their experiences from their home countries. So um, I think that's a mistake. And um, it is a, it's, it's impossible for us to understand their experiences in the United States without connecting their experiences um, in China. So. Um, so my research questions really covers uh, three interrelated stages of um, their time, so following life course uh, perspective, uh, before arrival, um, after arrival, before arrival. So it's uh, something that I want to focus on today and sharing with you some of the data and findings. Uh, why and how do these students choose to study in the United States? And after arrival, uh, I focus on their academic and social experiences. I was asking their um, their thoughts on how their previous schooling in China has helped or hurt their education in the United States, and how their college major choices, similar to or different from uh, their American peers and their peers back in China. Do they have close American friends? What are the barriers? And what are the barriers for classroom participation? I know that, you know, from my perspective, some of the professors here, some of the students here in this room, you all have some experiences in terms of um, classroom participation, some unique characteristics um, embodied by Chinese students. And I'm also looking um, at their um, sort of looking back and ahead and asking them their reflections about their experiences studying in the United States and what their <coughs> plans for upon getting a degree. Um, so main findings um, really trying to um, 
look at how this duality of ambition and anxiety is manifested. So um, here is sort of this foreshadow of a few findings here um, from my book, and I don't have time to cover it all. I highlight um, the two things that I, I, I do want to talk about uh, in red. So first of all, ranking guides the college choices. Um, st uh, students and their parents are obsessed with the ranking, and I'll provide um, explanations for that. And testing culture how they really apply to colleges in the United States. Um, are testing culture alleviated? Uh, the finding is they're not. Uh, they're just replaced by new tests and more tests as they get away from Gaokao, uh, the college entrance examination in China. And this unfulfilled needs of social integration, um, a lot of um, a lot of college administrators in America, a lot of American students saying that Chinese students uh, like to um, hang out among themselves. Um, and the, my findings show that um, the lack of integration doesn't really mean the lack of desire. So there is a huge amount of desire um, that really contribute to a lot of social anxiety as well. And then um, in choosing college major choices, they're really caught in the competing values uh, reflected in Chinese society being very pragmatic and collective activist oriented and influenced by their families and friends and peer networks and this individualistic um, following my heart, my interest, um, you know, expressive, so-called expressive individualism value in the United States. And this dilemma of speaking up in classroom reflects a huge amount of um, anxiety and this vexing decision of stay versus return as well. All right, so I use mixed methods um, for this research. Um, I focus on full-time undergraduate students of four-year institutions. The reason that I do not really study community college students, first of all, even though there are uh, a pretty significant amount of college students um, in community college in the United States, but their number um, of Chinese students are really a minority, um, less than around 10%, and a lot of them are actually aiming to transfer to four-year colleges in, the United, uh, uh, in American higher education. So I focus on four-year institutions, and I use, um, as you can see, ma macro-level enrollment data from Institute of International Education in the United States. I also draw from macro-level data uh, from Chinese Ministry of Education in terms of um, Chinese students, college major choices, their enrollment, um, and the number of students across the years taking Gaokao. And um, for this particular research, I also conducted online survey and in-depth interviews. I conducted field work from the year of 2013 to 2017. Every summer, I went back to China, and also one sabbatical leave. Uh, I stayed in eight Chinese public high schools, uh, and these are not re regular public high schools, those are the schools offering international tracks or international division, Bu, and one private school, they're in six cities, okay? So these are my sample. Um, so in those um, eight Chinese um, public schools with international divisions, I also try to um, talk with uh, high school counselors, those are the admissions counselors, not counseling, not psychological counselors. And I talk to each of the school um, division heads, Huh? principals, heads, and then foreign teachers. So overall, I had 108 um, in-depth interviews. And this is my online surveys. Um, as you can see, the survey participants show that their backgrounds are indeed pretty uh, privileged, especially as you can see their parent um, education. Uh, overwhelming disproportionate number of parents are coming from um, college and graduate school. And there are still uh, what, what I call first generation college students, less than 20%. And they experience, they exhibit very distinct disadvantages. I'll show you um, in the later slides um, in terms of various academic and social outcomes. So um, here are their parents' occupations. Um, as you can see, you know, a lot of times media coverage focusing on children of CEO, business owners. Uh, they're really the new rich um, sort of uh, strata in China. Um, but actually, most of the children are coming from uh, salaried workers who are the professional uh, professionals in China. And I particularly want to highlight a occupation. 
I think it's pretty revealing. Professor. So Chinese professors are, you know, for both mothers and fathers are among the top occupations who send their children abroad. So in other words, these are the higher education insiders, they're frontline um, higher, higher education practitioners, and they don't really trust their own education and they send uh, their kids abroad. So, um, so besides that, so this is a, a very much uh, privileged, definitely population, but these privileged uh, children sort of primarily coming from middle and upper middle class families, they really set the tone for the urban Chinese education options and they influence working class families' education options as well. So um, even though they're the minorities, I still want to share with you some of the uh, stories here. Uh, students from working class backgrounds. Um, Peter, he's from Shanghai. His father is a driver, and his mom is a cashier. Um, so one of the stories, um, a story, uh, the episode that Peter shared with me especially touched my heart. Um, he had never boarded a plane until the moment he took SAT because he had to go to Hong Kong um, to take the test. His father has never taken a plane either, even though he himself um, is a driver and his job is sending guests and back and forth to the airports numerous times. He's never taken a plane. So, um, so the natural question is how could they afford their their son to finally he enrolled at, U at University of California in San Diego, which is average $50,000 a year. Um, how can they afford to send Peter abroad? Um, what they do is they sold their apartments in Shanghai, uh, and that apartment is basically inherited from the grandmother's generation. So they co live with Nai Nai, uh, and, and, and that apartment was allocated before the market economy, you know, you have this apartment, residential apartments allocated by your employer. So they sold the apartments, they moved to the margins of the city, and they realized a profit and using that profit to send Peter abroad. So when I ask him why, why do they really want to do that, really put the whole asset behind Peter's education? And here's Peter said, Chinese parents tend to sacrifice for their children and want the best for them. Here in Shanghai, people consider studying in the United States is the best. It is just natural to follow this trend. So I highlight the word natural here because um, I think that is the generational differences because it is not very natural at all in my generation for parents to consider sending their children abroad and putting their whole assets behind. Um, I think that is really the change that uh, the study abroad, there is almost a culture of study abroad in urban China. Study abroad is no longer reserved for a few academic or economic elites. So the question is how so? Um, I argue in my book that um, this has become this new education gospel in urban China. I highlight urban, it is indeed a very urban phenomenon. Um, as China experienced fast urbanization, um, over 50% now population lives in urban areas. Um, so in my sample, extremely few people are coming from rural areas. So if I argue study abroad has become the new education gospel, what is the old? The old gospel is, education gospel is Gaokao, for sure. That's why people are saying Gaokao is ruthless, is horrible, it's still one of the most effective um, selecting mechanism in China to make sure um, fairness and um, quote unquote equal opportunity, okay? So um, if I use the word gospel, it really means it's a kind of, it's a sense of salva salvation. So what does study abroad really save people from, okay? So here are a couple rationales. First is they rescue some of the Chinese students from their undesirable Gaokao scores and the lackluster college placement. So Chinese Gaokao is a test that determines college access and placement. Okay, so in other words, uh, I forget to mention a personal detail that I, I, I got my first degree from Nanjing University where Mary spent as a foreign student years ago. And uh, how I got into Nanjing University through Gaokao. So I am actually the beneficiaries of this um, kinds of, but I, you know, I get into this not because my parents went to Nanjing University, uh, it's because, um, you know, 
only because of the test score, okay? So if now, 20 years ago, if you don't really have a good test scores and getting into a good college, you're, you know, I don't really want to use the word doomed, but pretty much so. Um, and, but now, people have choices. Um, so they rescue them from this uh, undesirable Gaokao scores. And for some, they just escape from Gaokao. They don't even take it, okay? So in my sample, only 32% of um, students took Gaokao. So um, they liberate some students from, you know, a lot of students um, mentioned this word oppressive, uh, torturing, test-oriented education system um, in the United States. And it's very interesting that a lot of these parents who are this rising middle class, the beneficiaries of China's market economy, are exactly the beneficiaries <coughs> of the Gaokao system. They're the winners of the Gaokao system. Because of that, they rise into the middle class, get those professional jobs, but now they don't really want their children to go through that because they know it's a, it's a very oppressive um, system. So in, in those kinds of ways, you know, either taking Gaokao or not taking it, um, they regard studying abroad as uh, the education gospel, uh, uh, one of the ideal ways to get away from um, this um, undesirable education situations in China. So a lot of people would say, is that because higher education access in China is very limited? Yes, it is, but I have to say it is pretty expanded. Uh, the access um, is not so much of an issue as quality, okay? So that probably explains why the professors send their kids abroad. Um, higher education expansion in China is a very important policy context here. I want to go over a little bit, uh, starting from two, 1999. Um, the plan, actually three years after I went in, into college, um, China started this college um, expansion, okay? College expansion effectively has made um, Annual college enrollment increased from 1 million in 1998, that's before the expansion policy, to 6.4 million in 2009. So that's, that's 600 times, right? So in 2004, the overall enrollment has surpassed um, the American higher education students. Um, and so given the widened access, um, that is almost always the pattern that in a lot of countries, not just China, not just the United States, but all over the world, it is this the stratification. Increased, um, widened access um, also increased, um, deepened stratification. So it's super competitive to get into top colleges. Uh, Nanjing University is among them. It's, it's still extremely difficult to get into them. So, um, and increased access produce a lot of college graduates. Um, so the unintended consequence of those uh, college expansion is a dire labor market for college graduates. So this is another reason that they want to study abroad. They just want to increase their competitive advantages um, by having a foreign diploma, by going to graduate school um, here as well. So here is um, the survey data largely um, showing that U.S., you know, for example, U.S. credential as benefit for future career development as the most important reason for Chinese students to come in here. And when I was asking what are the factors in the choice of college, um, the importance of ranking looms large, okay? And parental suggestions also looms large. Uh, students are very much influenced by their parents, and parents are very much influenced by their peer networks. Um, and actually, they all converge on this issue of ranking. So parents influence them rarely to lower-ranked schools. They're always influencing them to go to um, the higher-ranked schools. So ranking also drives school transfer among the few cases in my sample that they transfer schools Every case is they transfer to a higher ranked schools, okay? Every case is. So how can we really make sense of ranking obsession? Um, I think this is actually not just about Chinese international students. Um, I want to talk just on a side note. Uh, the Harvard case also actually reflects this kind of uh, uh, obsession with ranking, this obsession with elite college enrollment. Um, Ranking recreates, sociologists argue that ranking recreates the social world, and this is actually more obvious for Chinese international students because they don't really know much about 
American higher education. There is a lack of information, knowledge. Uh, they don't really have parents or grandparents educating here. They don't really know about you know, the famous football team, for example, at Michigan or at Syracuse. So rankings are really providing this oversimplified information for them. And um, there's this um, you know, long-standing argument about saving face and family honor that uh, parents and children associate their education credentials uh, with honor and uh, the whole family face. Um, I also want to argue, this is some, something that um, I really much elaborate in my book, that is, um, Ranking actually provides not just oversimplified version, but taps at exact same kinds of psychology that Chinese students are socialized to fit with Gaokao. So a hierarchy of Gaokao scores determine the access to a hierarchy of colleges and universities in China. So there is a score, and you get into the higher scores you go to, the better schools you, you, you can be placed. So the straightforward numbers of ranking lay bare the hierarchy of colleges and universities, almost providing the mirror image of Gaokao. So I argue this is actually very much fitting with their psychology of um, education choices. And so there is a lot of discussion, I think, around Harvard case about how to define merit, right? So um, merit, according, you know, based on Chinese education system and the students and the parents very steeped in the Chinese education system, merit can be measured in a single dimension of test scores in China. This is fundamentally different from the conception of merit, which is fluid, multi-dimensional, uh, very much captured by so-called holistic admission in the United States. So there is such a big gap between the two systems and the two conceptions of merit. And I think this is very much behind the Harvard case, too. And um, this um, Asian American, what is that organization? Largely populated by Chinese Americans. And if you're looking at their generational status, a lot of them are first generation Chinese Americans educated in China or getting their, a lot of their education in China. So they're very much influenced by their understanding about merit. So. OK, so um, i trying to identify the pathways, OK? So um, one of the motivations or purposes of my book is trying to um, identify a diverse set of students and, um, and trying to um, discover the different education trajectories. So um, from my research, there are four pathways of um, their trajectories coming here to American ed higher education. The first one is they directly come from the regular classes in Chinese public schools. So in other words, they graduated from Chinese public high schools and then enrolled as a freshman um, here in American college. And the second pathway is they graduated from the, the international um, public, uh, international division of those uh, public high schools to American colleges. And for the second one, I, I want to share with you more specific findings. And third one is um, they're coming from private schools in China. And those private schools, um, most of the private schools in China, uh, they used to only accept uh, foreign passports. And now there is a rising set of private schools that accepting um, Chinese passports. They're coming from there. And the fourth is they arrived um, in, in American high schools, oftentimes boarding schools, private boarding schools. Um, and, and, and then they enroll in American higher education. So one, two, three, four. And um, they're actually stratified by economic resources. The first pathway entails the least cost, and the fourth pathway is most expensive. Think about it, you know, American boarding schools, tuition plus the living cost, um, and close to 80% of the survey respondents traveled about the first and the second pathways to American higher education. So um, even though this is a privileged population, uh, there is still social class heterogeneity or diversity among this population. And with that comes with social reproduction as well. Okay? So this can be readily seen in the different kinds of educational trajectories they follow uh, in their move from China to America. And I found from the statistical analysis that first generation college students experience distinct disadvantages in both academic and social outcomes. Um, they're less likely to enroll in selective institutions 
as um, shown by this um, statistical findings. Um, so here I have parent with college education highlighted in red, and they're uh, positively and significantly predicting uh, their children enrolling in selective institutions defined as uh, top national 50 universities, Michigan um, included. Syracuse is not. Um, Syracuse is ranked 50 something. Um, and it's very interesting. We, our ranking climbed up. Our former chancellor was fired because our ranking uh, plummeted from 50s to 60s. And now from 60s to 50s back, we see really a uh, uptick of Chinese international students enrolling in our university. Um, and um, here is speaking up in classroom also parents uh, with college education, their kids are more likely to speak up in classroom, more comfortable than first generation college students. And here is making American friends in terms of social integration, they're also better off. So you do see there is uh, this kind of first gen generation college student disadvantages. And I want to highlight this because oftentimes their economic resources mask their social and cultural marginalization or disadvantages on campus. All right. So um, in the remaining time, I want to share with you my findings about this, uh, uh, this very interesting, actually before I start this research, I'm, I'm not even aware of this phenomenon. Actually starting uh, from my interviews with international students and you know, asking them how they really travel or their pathways, I came to know that the international divisions in Chinese public schools is a, is a new education sort of uh, initiative in China. So this is a new program starting around 2003 or 4 in Beijing uh, to teach international curriculum like AP, IB, A level. I think that's a three major um, English-based curriculum and prepare students to study abroad. Um, so the admission is based on their Zhongkao test scores, which is uh, test scores they have to obtain um, graduating from like middle school to high school. Okay, so plus. Interviews. Interviews are English-based, trying to test their spoken English. Um, they, um, so my first question is, um, are they just economic elites? Um, do their Zhongkao test scores lower than the, the, the usual test scores required in the high school? Actually, among the seven schools, four had scores 20 to 40 points lower. Only 20 to 40 points lower, not really a whole lot. And the other three are actually have higher test scores than the regular division, okay? They charge as much as 15,000 US dollars, so it's like 10 RMB, mm, annual tuition, and they entail interviews to ensure English proficiency. And the students enrolling in international divisions, they usually opt out of Gaokao because they study only the English curriculum and sort of prepare them for higher education. Um, in the United States or Britain uh, or British uh, or Australia. So um, student interviews, um, so selection process is, is actually student interviews plus parents interviews. Parent interview is required in one highly selective schools in Beijing with national prestige, if not really the top um, national high schools in, in the whole nation. Um, when I was asking why they want to test, uh, they want to interview not just students but their parents, here is the division head, Mr. Jiang's um, answer. I think it's very interesting. Here is here is his quote. We want to make sure that parents are on the same page with us in terms of educational philosophy and their approach towards their children. We want them to understand that their children studying in the international division are going to be educated in elite institutions in the United States where equality and freedom, individual freedom, are core values. We want to select parents whose values are consistent with ours. We do not want parents who are authoritarian and controlling. Okay, so this is this this is really interesting to me. Um, I just want to share with you that I, I think this is the cultural capital at its very best, and see how they're really incorporating that into the selection or institutional gatekeeping to make sure that their students are not just economic elites, academic elites, but also culturally consistent with their values. I think it's pretty ironic that this is a national prestigious uh, public high schools uh, openly advocating for sort of Western values and trying to select parents based on that. So um, 
my, my other question is trying to evaluate, is testing culture alleviated uh, because these students are not going to take Gaokao. So as, as, the, as my generation going through Gaokao, my natural hypothesis is uh, they're living a relaxed lifestyle. They're having so-called not test-oriented education. But my findings are exactly opposite. Gaokao is replaced by the pressures of new tests and more tests because these students are trying to take advantage of multiple testing opportunities. So most of the students I interview, they take ACT and TOEFL multiple times, trying to um, uplift their test scores, maximum high test scores. So um, because they, they're trying to, they perceive um, the threshold of elite institutions here are getting higher and higher. And these kinds of perceptions are not entirely uh, misguided. This is pretty much confirmed by the director of college counseling as well. So they actually argue that um, back in 2009, their students are not as uh, well prepared, uh, are not so strong. They can get very into very good colleges, but not, not anymore. So these students have to uh, the, go through increasingly competitive environment now. So here is something that um, I find is very interesting, this so-called very much a paradoxical nature of educational desires. Um, here is a couple of very um, influential books uh, talking about educational desires uh, of Chinese, um, only oftentimes only child generation. Um, one is Andrew Kipnis, Governing Educational Desires. Um, so, so it's really focusing on how Chinese students and their parents um, regard education not so much as a rational economic reasoning. So going to college uh, in and of itself is uh, representing uh, our prestige. So here, educational desires is really extend beyond national borders. It's, it's, it's trying to get into this very prestigious elite uh, world-class universities. But um, here is a paradox of such desire. So on one hand, um, they want to get the highest test scores possible. They take tests multiple times. They fly all over Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore to take tests. And they even skip foreign teachers' um, classes. So I also interview foreign teachers. Those teachers are teaching human civilization, geography. And during the testing season, they don't even have students showing up because those students are in Shanghai or Hong Kong taking tests or taking test prep classes. So this is this one desire. But the other desire is when you're asking these students, they all are saying that they want to get away from testing. The reason that they want to get into American liberal arts education is they're not fixated on test scores. So it's almost as if they're trying to get the highest test scores to get away from the test-oriented system. To me, that's really interesting. Um, so overall, I think this is a good time for me to stop. And um, really, ambition and anxiety um, define the experiences the new, of the new China. And the Chinese international students are the very embodiment of it. And um, the gap between the education systems, the two societies really create a large void that drives up the anxiety. And um, I have a chapter in my book that um, sort of offering some kind of policy implications that American universities need to be more proactive, um, not just in terms of uh, supporting students once they arrive, but really um, starting from the admissions process, um, really reaching out to students and families on the ground um, instead of um, just waiting for them to understand this very intangible, holistic admissions that they know very little about. Thank you very much. So I don't really have time to talk about uh, the other chapters. I think most of the materials I covered today is chapter two and three, and I offer table of contents here. And in case you, you want to ask questions about various other chapters, I'd like to entertain. Thank you. So can I ask the first question? I really like this topic. I'm really interested in this topic. And I also have a microphone, so. <laughs> um, so one of the things I'm interested in is the parents. So, and as you pointed out, they have the Gaokao background. <clears throat> and one thing I wanted to know is if you could separate, is it are you able to separate your analysis of the parents' anxiety 
and ambition versus the kids. And I'll give you this example because it was when I realized this interesting thing that was happening. My kids, who are American, went to a local school in Shanghai in 2012, 2013. And my son was seven, so he was in first grade, six, seven. And the first grade class was predominantly Chinese, uh, local Chinese, exactly as you say, white collar professionals. And what struck me about these parents, who I got to know a bit, was that they had chosen, well before their child showed expertise or not expertise at the Gaokao, that their child at six was not going to Chinese university. And I just was so amazed by that. And so I really wonder how much of the anxiety and ambition is the parents? And then the kids, you know, by the time they're 14 or 15 and making these decisions, that decision has actually been made for them many, many years ago. Thank you, Mary. This is a very interesting um, case. And I very much echo with your experience because I have a son who is uh, nine years old. And a lot of my friends in China, they, they, they had similar kinds of comments. They always ask me, when should I send my kids abroad? It's like the default. Um, it's, 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 it's not really asking uh, whether. It's when. It's a middle school or a high school or a college. So um, absolutely, I think the ambition and anxiety of parents really uh, occurred way much earlier in the life course of these children. And the ambition and anxiety of children that I um, describe and discuss in the book um, largely refer to their experiences during the college applications. And that overlaps with their parents' ambition and anxiety. But what is distinct uh, with their children's experiences is after their arrival in American higher education in terms of their college major choices, uh, their classroom participation, their social um, aspects that their parents have very, very little firsthand experiences. I have a question, and you've talked mainly about the fact that they're wanting to go to, in quotes, elite universities. Is there any, and I was at the University of Alaska Fairbanks where we had Chinese students too. Is there any talking about subject matter rather than eliteness of people going where the subject that they want to study or whatever <coughs> is better and irrespective of whether it's at an elite university or not? Thank you for your question. Um, and. Absolutely, there are a lot of students in every major university, elite, non-elite, selective, non-selective. Um, actually, in my sample, there's 40% there's of students enrolling in the so-called selective institutions, which includes the national 50 top major universities, top 20 lib liberal arts colleges. So for the students who are enrolling in non-selective institutions, those are primarily those students who don't really have desirable Gaokao scores, or they, they could not even get into uh, colleges in China. So they come here, and they have a wider access to American higher education. In terms of subject matter, that is actually very, very rarely mentioned. I do have a question in my survey asking them during their college choices, uh, whether program interest um, really drives uh, their college choice. And um, a minority of students choose that as an a, a important reason. And it's actually a figured very important role when, when I later run the models for predicting um, social integration and um, speaking up in classrooms. So in other words, if they choose the college based on program interest, they actually fare better in terms of social integration and um, academic integration in terms of classroom participation. But unfortunately, that's not really among their priority factors. OK. Uh, two questions here. Hello. Um, so my question was, um, in the last point in your summary, you said that American universities need to be more proactive in providing support uh, for Chinese students, especially first generation students. Uh, do, what are some specific examples do you think would uh, do that? How could universities do that? OK, um, I can start uh, from this um, um, specific example of during the uh, 
the college admissions stage. Okay, so so far I don't know about Michigan. Um, you might do a better job, but most of the universities, um, including my own university at Syracuse, uh, they don't really invest in the recruiting process in China. They don't. Um, most of the college uh, admissions um, done for students from China, they're just waiting, the admissions officers waiting in the office and for their application materials, okay? So expecting that, they know the, the system pretty well, expecting that uh, they're just like American students, um, going through similar kinds of uh, secondary school system, going through similar kinds of extracurricular activities, uh, course selections, but they're not. So that is something that um, I think there is a, such a disconnect between American higher education and Chinese secondary school uh, systems that American college admission officers need to be aware of. I think direct partnering with the local schools, especially good key schools, are very important um, in trying to save um, Chinese students and their families um, resources and effort going through. Right now, they just get help and support from agent. So there is uh, some discussions in my book that Chinese students argue that uh, using agency help just makes sense. That is, I quote some of students saying that, just makes sense because without agency, a lot of a lot of them don't really know how to navigate the process. Um, but agency, some are doing a good job, some are not. So it's a very complicated uh, process, complicated picture, unregulated uh, at all. Um, leaving a lot of um, um, Chinese students and their parents very vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, my question is more on students' experience after their arrival. So what do you think the use of social media or other information sources Chinese students use would influence their experience in the US? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that is a great question. Um, even though I didn't really ask the social media question directly in my research, um, it do comes up. So, um, so for example, WeChat um, has been the predominant communications uh, vehicle. And um, a lot of times they communicate through social media before their arrival. So in other words, for example, at Michigan, you could have people from Shanghai or even smaller city and um, their Laoxiang fellow, you know, fellow, um, residents from the same town and they immediately connected before their arrival and that really feeds into um, this uh, sort of uh, co-national or even co-town kinds of a network and I would I would think that social media actually uh, promotes um, this um, it's, it's social media works for anyone, I think, the general American society as well, creates this, uh, I would say, echo chamber. And it's, it's, it's really a, a, a mechanism, to some extent, creating a segregation um, that really contribute to um, the social experiences of Chinese students in the United States as well. And that's, um, that's something that American higher education needs to be proactive as well, in terms of providing more diversified uh, networking platforms. Um, so in the book, I really argue that um, American higher education cannot really depend on Chinese students to take their own initiative. Uh, you know, just be um, have this uh, nice personality. You know, outgoing and making friends on their own. Uh, sink or swim approach is not going to work. Um, you have to create a more institutionalized approach. Um, so I think WeChat is very, very informative and supportive. Uh, I'm not really against. Uh, those kinds of uh, social media um, creates um, very supportive um, so-called, um, I think some sociologists argue, protective segregation. It's actually helpful and supportive. But at the same time, especially um, my research shows that it's the desires of Chinese students themselves. They want to diversify their networks. So, but they just don't know how. I think here is where institutions can really um, be proactive and provide better systematic support. Thank you. Hi. Uh, the question I have has to do with the, uh, one of the remarks in the slideshow that uh, the enrollment of, of in higher education in China exceeded the U.S. in uh, total enrollment in 2004. And I recall a statistic from uh, about that time frame 
The U.S. was turning out about 30,000 graduate engineers a year, and China was turning out about 300,000. Mm -hmm. Is there a national, was there, during this rise in enrollment, was there a national policy directing students to move to certain uh, areas of study? That is a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, there is a chapter, I think chapter six, um, um, has pro providing elaborate discussion on college major choices. I compare the international students from China to their uh, college peers in, in China and then in the United States. Engineering looms large, for sure, and Chinese international students are way much more likely to study engineering than American counterparts, um, and, um, but they're not as likely to study engineering as their Chinese counterparts in China. Um, so I don't really think there is a national policy pushing students in STEM fields. Um, if, um, even though there is no national policy pushing them in STEM fields, but there is a strong culture of um, valuing um, math and science in China starting from grade school. Um, I can share with you my personal experiences. Um, in Chinese high school, I think it's still there. The policy has, hasn't, hasn't really been changed over the past 20 years. In, in high school, um, students start to be tracked into two primary tracks. One is science, the other is arts or arts and hum humanities. So you only have two choices, basically. And there is no other tracking before. So students don't really get tracked until like 11th grade. So um, smart students do science. There is this kind of expectation. So I was doing pretty well in science, but I choose arts. And I remember both my parents and myself was getting a lot of pressure from teachers and other peers saying that, you know, why? So there's this very dominant culture of valuing math and science, prioritizing math and science, or even having this uh, um, false equivalence between intelligence and science. So there is a huge national culture, even though there is, I don't really think there is a policy, that encouraging students to do STEM. Um, starting from, I think, 1950s, uh, there is uh, this um, modernization effort um, under Mao Zedong's administration, starting, you know, trying to learn from Russia, emphasizing on heavy industry. I grew up, I think every school kid know there is a, um, there is a saying, Chinese saying that, you know, if you master math, science, math, physics, and science, you're fearless, you're fearless. Uh, no, no matter where you go, something like that. So I think that is behind. That culture is, is deeply uh, rooted. Um, that is behind. Even though I think uh, the past two or three decades of a market economy has given rise to uh, business and economics. That's why you can see that Chinese international students, those are the two major fields they, they, they choose their college major in. One is STEM, the other is economics and business. Is there any tracking for physical abilities? Like gymnastics or sports uh, accomplishment? There is uh, that for, I think, special talent, that you need to um, gather some kinds of uh, credential to get direct ad admissions. But those kinds of policies change year by year because there is a lot of corruptions going on around that area. Yeah. Thank you. So it's a very interesting presentation, and I feel like I have encountered like similar struggles many years ago, but later I choose to do gao call, and now I'm here. <laughs> so um, my question is, um, is like the ambition and anxious and anxieties like the sin, a particular Chinese thing, or it, or a, like a gao call thing? It's like, uh, for instance, in South Korea, we also have this kind of gao call stuff. So I was wondering, like, if you have checked out anything about what's, is there any difference between like South Korea international students here and Chinese students here? You're right. Um, this is a great point. Um, this is not unique to Chinese students, uh, but I would argue that it is unique to Chinese students in terms of the intensity. Uh, and why the intensity is unique? Because exactly what I'm talking about, China has experienced this very unique, unprecedented, rapid growth and social transformations. So um, I think any society that experienced this kinds of uh, growth and um, transformations um, would have you know, this 
kinds of a problem of ambition and anxiety. And um, manifested in Chinese students, it is their parents' um, desire to, to protect their newly gained status, to protect uh, their wealth, to um, preserve uh, their newly gained social status. And one of the things they would perceive as most effective to preserve their social status is through education. So um, I think you can see similar kinds of things in Japan and South Korea or in any um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, they, they all have this kinds of a centralized national examination system. And you can all see similar kinds of uh, ambition and anxiety, the horrible test-oriented education system. And students are, on one hand, struggled. On the other hand, um, very much value you know, these kinds of opportunities. But I think uh, for this new wave of Chinese international students, what they experience is this very unique, intensified um, versions of the duality of ambition and uh, anxiety. Yeah. Hi, oh. thanks for the, uh, the uh, presentation. So I, I want to uh, ask you to speak more, a little bit more on the, uh, I think a paradox you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so on the one hand, you know, this is uh, the move largely uh, to kind of American education <coughs> was motivated by this kind of desire to escape from this gaokao, call, this uh, one time you know, um, test that determine your life. Um, now, um, but at the same time, you have this, uh, so to get into American education, you have this, you know, market uh, that, uh, that sort of have all, all kinds of agencies that try to uh, help you to get ahead in that, um, a, a, a different kind of rat race, right? Right. Um, it's just a not one time thing. And I wonder that market, so I guess the paradox is that they said, well, they want their kids to go to the um, to the U.S. for liberal education. Um, that emphasizes more on the kind of individualism. But at the same time, the mechanism that they the uh, they pursue this goal is very market driven. It's very social Darwinism. Um, so, what do you think that once they get into so how that shape you know the like students' mentality and and whether that uh, you know have an effect in their sort of experience in the US. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely, this kind of mentality has huge impact on their experiences in the United States. Um, so um, for one thing, um, Chinese international students, um, they actually, this is some, some of, uh, one of the uh, three ways that I argue in my book that we have to understand uh, their experiences by connecting China with the United States um, in three ways. One is they bring their test-oriented mindset to um, their study and application experiences here. And so in, that, in, in the first one, Ch American higher education can intervene by providing more support that they don't. They, they currently are, um, are not in place. And that really leaves those students um, very much in the hands of those rat race of market-oriented, very much uh, market-based uh, private sector of um, test prep agency center. And um, the second way is their um, uh, their experiences in Chinese, higher ed uh, Chinese education system have this very big impact on their learning experiences here in the United States. And um, I talk about their college major choices in engineering. And uh, very, very uh, predominantly, they actually study pretty well in certain subjects. Even some of the students are not in STEM. Uh, they're, they're doing well in math, even though they're not a very strong math student in China. Um, and they have uh, formulated certain kinds of study habits that is very much um, in China as well, uh, or steeped in the Chinese education system. For example, they believe in effort rather than ability-based um, sort of learning modes. And um, what else? The third one is the social relations. I argue that um, in China, there's uh, this very strong sense of collectivism, even though um, some scholars has argued that uh, Chinese society has become increasingly individualistic. Um, 
it is becoming increasingly individualistic in a lot of um, social organizations such as family, relationship, but in terms of education, uh, educational uh, structure, uh, the social organization, the curriculum is still heavily centralized, standardized, and collectivist oriented. So they bring those kinds of collectivist or orientation to American society, and that has a huge impact on their social relations as well. So they start with this collectivist mindset where they don't really find their group, they go back to their own group. So that's, um, that's how you know, this um, connection between China and the United States is actually very, very vital to understand their experiences. Hi, thank you for your wonderful speech. So um, my name is Yan Chen. I'm a student from School of Education. So as a future ed educator, I think you briefly mentioned about Suzhou Jiaoyu. Um, so based on your research, do you find that uh, parents who send their children to United States focus more on cultivating their children, um, their, you know, like Suzhou Jiaoyu, like how they treat people, how they communicate with each other, uh, about their social emotional development, or students in China also care about that. Just based on your research, do you find is there any differences between two groups? Uh, two groups of students in China and the United States? No, like parents who send their children in China and the parents who um, just keep their children in China, do those do two different groups of parents, do they have um, different kind of focus, like do they expect, uh, accept their children to have more um, cultivation on Suzhou Jiaoyu or there's not really big difference? All right, I see. Okay, so um, I have to say that my research is not really including parents, so I've not really um, studied parents. So my um, data on parents are all from children's survey and interviews. Um, and I think you know, just from my understanding, Su um, Jiaoyu is almost like a narrative um, that you know Chinese you students. Define for everybody what Suzhou Jiaoyu means. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Great. So um, it's a great, it's a great. It's a great question. Yeah, quality education, right? Or uh, well-rounded. Um, sometimes people use the word well-rounded ed education. I think that is anything that is sort of um, different or antithetical to test-oriented education. Okay, so I think you know Chinese students and parents, regardless of where they are, they idolize uh, well-rounded, uh, well-rounded education. I don't really think it's their value system that re really drives. Um, parents and students' decisions is mostly their resources um, drives their decisions. And um, but I th there 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 is a minority of uh, students um, in my sample that they they have taken Gaokao and they are able to get into top universities in China, but they chose to come here. There is one student I remember, um, he he can he can go to Zhejiang University, Zhejda. That is. Um, he said his dream school. He 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 took the Gaokao. Um, he also he's like, you know, having this uh, double preparation of Gaokao and also SAT TOEFL. This realm of study abroad and also studying in China. And he said his test scores are good enough to get to Zhejiang University, his top school. But he still chose to come here. Um, the reason being, um, he think here education is a liberal arts education, offering more well-rounded education. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. As someone who grew up in both China and the US, I can personally relate to a lot of the things that you talked about. Um, the question that I have is relating to one child policy that you briefly mentioned at the end, uh, because I think that a lot of the phenomenon that you talk about, um, there's a lot of parallel with other international students from Asia, especially in India. However, something that sets China uh, Chinese students apart from other international students is the one-child policy, uh, China having the one-child policy, and I can see that, you know, affecting, you know, you said that um, one drive for students to study abroad is because the parents want to keep their economical status, um, and uh, one-child policy influences this in a way that parents have to put all their pressure onto the one kid that they have. Um, so if you could talk about 
the influence on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, simply speaking, you know, one child <coughs> have the most amount of all the pressures as well as the most resources, yeah. right? Think about Peter's example. Uh, he's definitely one child and his parents sold the apartment moving to realizing the profit uh, putting the whole assets behind the single child's educational future so i think one only child policy is very controversial i think in the west and increasingly so there is this uh, perspective that is pretty much neglected especially with regards to gender inequality is that it is actually an added benefit to daughters that they are having this uh, concentrated resource Sources from their parents. Um, that's why you can see this um, this um, huge um, accomplishment and educational attainment among girls in China nowadays as well. So um, yeah, the resources, yeah, enabling their educational aspirations. The question is. Um, it was put that many of the Chinese students here speak Mandarin and wondered if there's a reason why this student who is Chinese is not hearing other dialects here, if there's a reason for that. Because in China, there are colleges that's where students speak their dialects. Are you asking why Chinese international students in the United States don't really speak their hometown dialect? Okay, all right, so, um, well, first of all, I don't really find that is the case. If they, um, usually most school kids in China, they can speak both their dialect and their Mandarin, because Mandarin is a sort of standard um, Chinese. Um, so I find the students that I have, um, if they find their fellow um, residents from like Shanghai, for example, they speak Shanghai, Shanghainese together. If they find fellow residents from Fuzhou, they speak Fuzhou dialect uh, at the same time. So yeah. if they don't really speak their dialect, that's because they don't really find uh, their friends from the same town. Hi, thank you so much. Um, your presentation was very um, fascinating. So I'm in the School of Public Health, and my research is focused on looking at uh, mental health uh, outcomes and help seeking in Asian uh, international and in domestic students. And from my work, I found based on like national level self-report data and other smaller studies that the prevalence of depression and anxiety among international Asian students, and this is Asian students as a whole, so not just Chinese students, is actually much lower compared to their like domestic counterparts and um, also other students of color and also white students. And I was wondering if you had any ideas of what's driving this trend, because I've always found this finding to be very misleading and I didn't really believe it, so I just um, thought, mm -hmm. wondered if you had any ideas. <laughs> Well, I don't, I'm sorry, because uh, I've not really studied mental health um, aspects. Um, as you can see, I studied a lot of things in the book, but mental health and um, other aspects that I have not really gathered much data from. I, you know, same as you, I, I don't really have, when I was listening to your um, sharing about this national data showing they have lower uh, depression, I thought you were asking about why they're having a higher depression because I saw, um, I think Yale has this report showing that um, there's a very substantial number of international students, I think from China, having serious mental health um, issues. And uh, in my home institution, for example, um, they have, several major episodes of international students' mental health crisis. Um, and um, until last year, they decided to hire a Mandarin-speaking counselor, which is a huge <coughs> help. Um, because there is a, this very different, um, as much as education systems are different, um, they have also very different approach to mental health uh, support. So for Chinese international students, if they choose to go to counseling, and the American approach is oftentimes giving them pills, uh, for example, and a lot of Chinese students find that is very, very um, absurd, and they don't really want to take pills or medications, or they don't really want to be taken to hospitals to, for treatment. They want to have some, some, someone to talk with them out of it. So there's this, this very different understanding, and, and some of the students are not um, feeling so open to talk about their feelings in the first place. So um, 
I think I am also very skeptical about those kinds of reports. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just have another question that you brought back some memories. What happens to those who fail or don't do so well? I'm thinking back, it's granted in the 1950s, a Chinese student who has spent four years in the loft of the United of First Methodist Church because he wasn't doing well until it was found out. So have you looked into what happens to those who don't meet all of these expectations for whatever reason? Um, it's not, I haven't really talked about this in the book, but um, obviously there are students who drop out and there are students who, um, there will be very uh, interesting statistics on dropping out and I don't really find any. Um, and with this massive wave and increase of international students, you can find a wide spectrum actually of academic and social outcomes. So I think they, they, you know, they, some of them don't graduate, some of them return to China, some of them fail in the system. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question around your definition of Chineseness, um, specifically um, thinking about the way that you framed your talk as providing a more nuanced and balanced portrait against larger media discourses about Chinese students, how Hong Kong and Taiwanese students fit within that? Because in a particular situation, you may imagine that they actually see Chinese students as kind of the hegemon given you know, global geopolitics. So how, how, do they, how do their experiences differ and what are the kind of conflicts that sort of your definition of Chineseness um, sort of draws out? Thank you so much for this question. I apologize. I should have uh, defined this uh, at the start of the presentation. I did define this at the start of my book, that this study only focused on students from mainland China. So I don't really include students from Hong Kong or Taiwan, simply because students from Hong Kong or Taiwan, they're not newcomers uh, to American higher education, even at undergraduate level. So at undergraduate level, this massive growth as a recent phenomenon, they're uniquely mainland, mainlanders. So that is why. Um, and, and I situate this phenomenon into this a huge um, social transformation that is also about what happened in mainland China. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about how that transformation might affect conflicts between Chinese students, regardless ethnically Chinese students rather than sort of nationally Chinese students on US campuses? Absolutely, I think, um, you know, as you can see, you know, recent um, events happening in Hong Kong, you can see there is a division. And um, Chinese students from mainland, um, they don't really consider themselves uh, in the same camp with uh, students from Hong Kong or Taiwan. Um, they have their unique, their distinct student organizations. Chinese Student Scholar Association are the student organization um, usually only admitting or including students from mainland China. So on US college campuses, you do see um, they're distinct. They're in, di in different camps. We have time for one more question. In the U.S., the single largest educational institution is the U.S. military. And it provides a delayed path to higher education for thousands of students every year. Does China have a similar path uh, through the military to higher education? Good question. I'm not so sure um, because um, at least not reflected in my, in my study. Yeah. I spoke too soon. We have one last question. <laughs> Hi, you laid out four paths. Do yeah. you have any information as to which students, or which path seems to be most successful for students coming over? I would guess that have the chance to go to high school first uh, would give them a big leg up. But do you have any data that compares these four paths? Um, I do compare um, I do compare students going through American high schools with students who have not. Um, this is actually a, I've known a couple of colleagues who are studying right now focusing on uh, Chinese international students who are right now studying as a high school students here in the United States uh, and their growth is phenomenal. 
over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, but still, oh, the overall population, the majority of students finish high school, uh, just because the resources entailed is, is enormous. That um, like students like Peter, they can probably afford, they can sell the apartment, afford the four year undergraduate ed education, but their parents could never afford high schools in the United States. But the rising upper middle class parents, they do consider American high schools potentially offering some kinds of benefits uh, to their children. And um, again, going back to this point of ranking, in this rat race of getting into um, what they perceive increasingly competitive college ad admissions race, their perception is if their students arrive in the United States earlier, and going through American high school. So in other words, they apply from here, not from China. They may get education advantages or competitive advantages in getting into um, top ranked universities. So I look into that and I don't really find any systematic ad ad advantages. I'm, I'm also looking at the social aspect as well. The social aspects they do. Obviously, you know, you can, you can just imagine students going through American high school, they speak better English. Um, they are having an easier time making American friends. They're having an easier time speaking up in classroom because they're just more exposed and immersed in American education system them longer. Um, but in my interviews, um, those high school students reflected uh, very, very mixed feelings. They, they, they recalled very painful and lonely and struggles while in high schools. Um, but they also acknowledged growth and development uh, and progress in their years here. So, so stories are very complicated um, and, and multi-dimensional here. And um, I think you would look forward to more literature and scholarship because more people are now working in this area. In my sample, there are 20%, less than, eight, I think 18% of them study in high school here. The model I'm more familiar with is staying with families rather than boarding school. Host family, yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're out of time, but I want to thank you for the great talk. Thank you.